edition of Active Living. We've got our world traveler here, Jim Robeck, and Jim's been traveling around the world, world again. This time he's been to uh, Nepal and to Bhutan. Right. And uh, we're going to learn a little bit about uh, your trip today, Jim. Okay. What do you got around your neck there anyway? Well, this is what they call a kata. It's supposed to be, when they come in the country, it's a symbol, uh, a symbolic scarf, and it's, it provides a blessing for a, um, a serene and safe journey through your trip for the next 18 days. Really? Yes. Okay, that's, good. So they provide this both in uh, Nepal and Bhutan, and it's very nice on, on that part there. Uh, interesting there you say about World Traveler, this flight was almost 14,000 miles to get there. Wow. So that's almost over half the distance around the world, because 25,000 miles around the world right. to travel around, and that's 14,000 miles it took. Almost, well, it took me 24 hours to get from Detroit to Kathmandu in Nepal. Wow. So it was a long trip. It was a, kind of a brutal, the first, the part from Chicago to uh, Abu Dhabi in UAE. It took you like about a week to recover from that, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, I'm surprised. I didn't, re it wasn't bad recovering. I took like two days because when I came back, I didn't stay, I stayed up for like 38 hours and I felt like I did one cycle over. Okay. And it only took me like two days and I didn't feel it after okay. that. It normally takes about a week there. Yeah, it was, um, when we got there, uh, about 8.30 at night, which is, there's 10 hours difference between here and Michigan, and um, so it was 8.30 there, it was like, um, I think it was like uh, 10.30 in the morning, or at night here on Tuesday, I was there on Wednesday. Okay. So it was 10 hours difference. And uh, just a couple of things uh, talking about uh, Nepal there, the, the welcome where you say hello in um, in Nepal, it was uh, Namaste, Namaste, something like that there. And then I want to interesting here about this thing. This is the flag of uh, Nepal. Interesting about this is the only flag in the world that is not rectangular or square. Really? So this is, it represents, these two peaks are the Himalaya Mountains, and the uh, blue represents the symbol of peace and harmony. The red is basically the brave spirit of the Nepalese people. And remember, the Gurkhas are from Nepal, and we're going to talk about it later on. Okay. And then you have the moon and the sun. The moon and the sun here. You saw the eclipse of the moon here that kind of covers the sun here. And then you had the sun with its 12 points. It represents the 12 signs of the zodiac and the 12 months of the year. Wow. So it's kind of an interesting flag, and it's the only one, I can say, in the world that's uh, this design is not rectangular or square. It is interesting. It is, and um, so it's a very nice flag, so I had to purchase one so I could speak about it. And basically, the flag symbolizes the national unity, they say the bravery and culture and religious faith of the Nepalese people. So okay. it's a very interesting flag, was uh, or, or actually commissioned in 1962, so very interesting flag. Uh, that, after that, uh, we started going to what they call the stupas. These are the stupas that are kind of religious monuments there. Okay. And they're like in the uh, uh, likeness of a Buddha. He's a sitting Buddha with his body and everything else. And uh, the primary re religion there is is a Buddhist religion. Now in uh, Nepal, it's 85% Hinduism, oh, and Hindu. Bhutan is 85% Buddhism. Okay. But they have the similar, you know, the the um, the, the uh, Buddhas and all that. They're similar, but. Okay. Uh, and they have these, what they call stupas, and these cortins, which we'll look at later on here. Now, the first one we went to uh, is called Sway and Buthan Bunath, and it's a stupa. It overlooks the Kathmandu Valley, which is a beautiful site there. When you say stupa, what do you? T what well, is a stupa? Well, that's that's the monument itself, okay. Okay. and that's what it's called a stupa. All right. And basically, um, it, basically, what it comes down to is um, it covers these sacred relics, supposedly where the Buddha may have come. And it represents, again, peace and harmony. It's the biggest thing about these Buddhas. They're, okay. I mean, stupas, that they're peace and harmony. And it's supposed to subdue any negative forces like war and famine. So that's the okay. whole idea of these stupas. And they have uh, these prayer flags that drape the stupas, and they also have these uh, prayer wheels. You turn, around, turn them as you walk around. You have to go clockwise. Right. And it, it's almost like saying silent prayers. And that's what you're basically doing when you walk around these stupas. And uh, they're basically 100 foot in diameter usually. They reach about 141 foot in height. And at the top of they got these eight eyes that look out like there's four, uh, two eyes in each direction. Right. They're supposed to look at over all the people. Mm -hmm. And it gives you uh, an, a sense of, you know, they can look at all the flock that's out there basically. Cool. And the question mark under the two eyes is the number one. I'm not sure, I forgot what it represents, but it's the number <laughs> one there. So, um, so people come there and they spin it and they say their prayers and they look at the monument. And um, so it's, uh, we saw the two there. The, the one was the uh, first one I mentioned. Then the other one is the, Buddha Hanith, and it's built, it was built in the 15th century, and it represents also the, uh, the earth, 
They call it earth, fire, water, and air. So it okay. all represents this, these, these stupas there. Um, and then from there, what we basically did, a couple items there which I thought was very interesting in the religion itself. They say the temple is your heart and your kindness is your religion, which is kind of interesting, I yeah. thought, because you know you can take any religion, you've got the kindness in there. Right. And they talk about the five poisons that people uh, have an issue with, or they say it's an issue with, they say the five are basically anger, desire, jealousy, ignorance, and pride. I thought those are pretty good, too. Oh, they say there's, great. there's 81 <laughs> more of those. What's the other 81? I mean, those could probably identify most of them there, okay? Yeah. Those are and terrific. Yeah, it's terrific. They're both those items there. When I say the key, the temple is the heart, and the re your kindness is your religion, so you can have any kind of religion you'd like there. Um, and also, they, well, these prayer flags are actually uh, in r rotation. They've got blue, um, green, red, white, and yellow. And they each represents a, um, a s kind of the elements of the earth. You know, the blue is the sky, and the, uh, the green is the uh, environment, which is the earth and water. The red uh, represents the uh, fire. Uh, the white is, oh gosh, it's the earth and the yellow. I'm sorry, it's the reverse. Yellow is earth and white is, geez, I can't remember right now, but it's, uh, they, they, they're represented in five different levels, so we can cover that a, bit, a little bit later okay. on. Okay. Uh, then we went to another city they call Bakatpur. It's a city of devotees of palace and temple. A lot, many, many temples are there, and the problem right. there was that a lot of them that we've seen were actually destroyed in the earthquake in 2015. Oh, really? Yes, and many countries are now donating a lot of money to repair, especially Japan, United States, and China. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to put these back up again. Wow. And when you look at some of these temples, they're rebuilding the scaffolding there that the people work on. It is so scary, I can't believe it. they got <laughs> women up there, and I mean, they've got these pulleys that are taking up the buckets of whatever, you know, right. cement or concrete, you know, to put new bricks in there. So it's very interesting there that, um, a lot of temples, and they were, were pretty well destroyed, unfortunately. It was really? really not very good. Then we went later on to what they call an area called Pashap, Pashap Tenneth, which is the crema cremation of the Hindu bodies. Okay. So we saw the pyres there. We, went to, uh, the, we were on one side of the river. The, the pyres were on this side of the river. We were on the other side of the river, and they already had bodies that were burning at the time that we got there. Really? Yeah, there were pyres there. There was smoking and burning and all that. And when the... Um, session is done about four and a half hours when the bodies are completely burnt. Right. Then they push them in this river, in the Bagawati River, and it is the most polluted river you can imagine. They <laughs> dump the body, whatever's left over, you really? know, the ashes, and they just scrape it off the, the pyre there and just put it in the river. So if the person didn't completely burn. I don't know. I guess, you know, maybe a bone there. You got a femur bone or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right, right. I would think so, yeah, because I don't imagine they got a perfect burning on some of these things there. But it normally costs them between 150 to 250 dollars to do this. Okay. Now, if they did an electric furnace that they built very near the grounds there, it was only cost you 15 dollars to cremate a body. Oh, really? But because their religion, they maintain this ceremony yeah. the way they take care of the bodies there. So it's something that. Uh, they continue to do. But you wouldn't want to live down river from there? Uh, any river part of the river. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, uh, the, the pollution in the, um, the river is, in the country is not very clean. It's, really? it's not as good. You know, Kathmandu, you think it's very interesting. It's this mystic thing in this Everest country because Kathmandu is your entry city to climbing Mount Everest. Everybody right. comes to the trekkers, the people want right. to travel around, trek around the mountains. They all come into Kathmandu. It's the only international airport. You can't go into Bhutan. You've got to take a smaller uh, plane into Bhutan because their national airport is between two mountain ranges, and they've got to come in and bank and then come in. It's really, right. yeah. Right. It's got, I think there's only a few air pilots that can do this, so they have to be uh, qualified to do this. Um, and then later that day, we, uh, we had dinner, and we had a lady come in. She had climbed Mount Everest two times, and she okay. wanted to do it again. And it cost about eighty to $90,000 to for a cost to, uh, to hike up to really? Mount Everest. Yeah, by the time you buy your permits, your Sherpas, your food, all these people you need to support you. Right. It's right. very, very expensive. And they're trying to limit that in, in, in Nepal now because there's too many people who are coming there, they're trashing the mountain, and so they're figuring, you know, they're starting to change that quite a bit to limit the amount of people that are coming right. up there. Right. Um, so then uh, after we had let, uh, pretty well completed um, Kathmandu, we flew to it area called the refu uh, Refuge in uh, Chitwan. It's a national jungle resort area. It took 25 minutes to fly there. You normally can take the bus, but the roads are so bad, it would take maybe seven or eight hours to drive, to f go there, it's only right. 100 miles. So they fly us from Kathmandu to uh, Chitwan. It's an airport there. So you're going from the Himalaya Mountains into a jungle? 
Yeah, we're going through a jungle now. Really? Yeah, exactly. Wow. There's a jungle within there. 100 miles of each other. Yeah, I mean, That's it, pretty you cool. know, I mean, it's high up there, and you see the the, the mountains and such. Yeah. Um, so I went there, and unfortunately, this is where I had got food poisoning. Oh no! And yeah, and fortunately, we had four nurses in our group. We got Samantha, Abby, and Olivia. They pretty well took care of me. So it ended up I had went to the hospital under emergency because I don't know sure I was having a heart attack or what. But when I went there, it was funny because it, it looked like a garage. There was two 20-watt light bulbs there, and this little guy comes out with a white coat on a stethoscope. He checks me out, and he says, your vitals are good. So I stayed there about 25 minutes and went back to the, to the lodge there, the resort there. And, but I didn't eat for the next two or three days because you're, oh, it was yeah. bad. <laughs> it wasn't very good. So we did, we th I think we got to that place where we had the uh, person who was talking about Everest. She uh, was talking, and we had a fish sandwich. I thought we'd get a fish fillet, but it was a fish sandwich. Okay. And I think that's where we got sick. There was about 10 of us got sick. There was oh, two really? women and myself were the got most violently got sick, but the rest were not in various stages there. Um, at that particular lodge there, the people went on the jungle tour, safaris, they did a boat ride in the whole nine yards. And we did, I came later, I think it was the next day. I felt better, went to indigenous uh, uh, tribe area where we saw how the people live right and then we also had an ox cart ride again we had one in Cambodia we had another ox cart right. ride here it's pretty neat so we'll see some pictures of that uh, we had a chance to um, visit a school there we provide children with books and pencil sharpers and pencils and that are all under sixth grade there right and um, well behaved you know they're all dressed in various uh, tunics there and it's a requirement now that kids have to go to school now. It wasn't in the past. Okay. And, th and so it was pretty good that we were able to. And we always do these on these tours that they, we go to these uh, schools and provide, you know, school supplies and that right. for them. So the United States does that? Oh, uh, well, people who bring it. We, oh, we are oh, personally okay. bring it. And then okay. also Gate 1 provides a lot of stuff too. Okay. So in either case there. And that night during, after, uh, well, before we went to dinner, we had these, uh, indigenous people coming over and they provided many dances. Oh, yeah. They use these bamboo poles that go around in a circle and they bounce it against each other, you know, and then we click, click, click. <laughs> So it was kind of interesting, and uh, but it's funny that it hit somebody's knuckles, you know, because they slam those damn bamboo poles against each other, you know. Right, but, right. And they go around a circle, and the guy with the drum there is pretty darn good. So it's kind of neat there. Um, from there, we spent uh, three days there. We went to a town called Pokahara, which is the second largest city in Nepal, and because in the whole town or whole country of Nepal is like 29 million people. I think it's like a million and a half. Mm -hmm. and, in the Kathmandu, and uh, I think in Pokhara was probably less than that. I'm not sure how how uh, how many people were there. Interesting part about that in this particular here, they get the three highest mountains in the Himalayas. There, they're all over 8,000 uh, meters, and meters? people are trying to say yeah, meters. I mean, there's 14 of these mountains because Everest is the highest, right? And these 14, well, there's K2 and the 14 here, and people have this tendency they want to climb all 14 mountains oh, here. Wow. It's crazy. There's only been like maybe less than 25. And then these mountains here, one of the mountains in Annapurna there is that one of them, they climb. 183 people have reached the top, but 63 people died. Oh. Now that's 33% of the people are dying or, you know, from climbing that mountain. And say, oh. why would you do that? Now <laughs> Everest is about 10% and K2 is about 25%. Really? So, I mean, that's the, uh, the uh, odds of you getting out of there alive. I mean, I, these guys, I don't understand why they do this. So, but they do it. Uh, it's a nice city. It was a big lake there, freshwater lake there. Uh, and the neat thing about that, a couple of things we went to see there was the Gurkha National Museum, which is the Gurkha soldiers, which are the most famous around the world, right. the most fiercest warriors and fighters. Okay. And they had a museum there of all these Gurkha soldiers that have served in the armies in India, in the British uh, forces, expedition forces, serve in Afghanistan now because they are the most brutal people that are warriors. I mean, they fought off the British when they tried to take over the country. Right. I think like a hundred of them took over like over a couple of thousand British soldiers and just beat the crap out of them. Say, get out of here, you know. <laughs> so so uh, they, they didn't come back as far as the British, but they uh, they still. And they had this uh, knife they called the kukuri. It's like a curved blade. It's so um, it's a beastly weapon. I mean, they would cut your head off in a swat, almost like a really? sickle. Yeah. I mean, it's it's quite a piece of uh, uh, instrument there to kill people, you know. So. Oh well, and uh, well that, uh, during that city there, we went and hiked to the top of this mountain. We were supposed to see a sunrise there, 
and it took about 45 minutes to reach the top. Again, one of those brutal hikes. He said, oh, about a 15, 20 minute hike. No, no, it was about 45 minutes. So oh, is that right? I didn't quite reach the top. There's 20 more steps. I said, ah, why am I gonna go up there? The sun hasn't come out yet and it's not gonna come out. So I just stayed there with a lovely lady there. Well, my friend, she went up and saw it there, you know, and they looked over the mountain, but said, didn't see the valley because it wasn't clear because the sun didn't come out. Right. It was there, but it was dark and it was right. kind of misty right. there. So, but the neat thing about they had this Peace Pagoda, Peace Pagoda up there. It's got a picture of that, and we'll show that in the uh, the video here. It's a beautiful white, uh, again, one of these stupas up there. Yeah. Really, it's right up very on top of the mountain there. So, yeah. um, and then we also went to what they call the International Mountain Museum, where these were the various trekkers that climb Everest, all the equipment they have, right. and all the tents, and the 14 highest mountains they showed pictures of, and various tribes that lived there. They showed their their dress and such. Right. It was very right, colorful, right, very right. nice, and they, it's a um, nice tribute to the uh, the mountain climbers in uh, in Nepal, and so and also certainly on Bhutan on Annapurna there. You get close. Um, so um, that night we had dinner with a typical typical dinner with the Tibetan family. They had uh, came to um, Nepal and um, from Tibet, and unfortunately, uh, for unfortunately the. Um, uh, Tibet has been really overruled by the communists of China. I mean, they're just really? getting beat up there pretty okay. bad. And this is where the Dalai Lama is not there anymore. And uh, so, so that was it. And then now we're coming back to Kathmandu, and we're going to talk about that here. The only country uh, or city we had back there was uh, called Patan. It was a city of fine arts and a lot more temples and monasteries and all that. Just to finish up on Nepal, uh, when we came back, we went to what they call this area here, which is called Patan. And we had a little girl there, she's five years old, it's uh, Kamari, and she actually, you have to bend down and get on your knees and you have to give a little donation. She puts your little mark on your head here. Oh, she's is that five right? years old with the mother. She's a princess or it's gonna be, you know, in waiting there, I guess, in, uh, in Nepal there, so. And um, then that night there, we had dinner with a businessman and he was a well-known person in Nepal there and he invited us to his room again and his house is absolutely beautiful. We had all kinds of appetizers and good stuff. It was incredible. It's just, uh, I mean, so, so hospitality is fantastic. Great. Okay, on to Bhutan, which is called the Land of Thunder Dragon. And it's a very unique country. It's got only 700,000 people there. Really? And they only allow about 14,000 tourists per year in right now. Okay. They want quality instead of quantity, where Nepal is all quantity. You know, they right. want to mind the tourists now because it provides millions of jobs for the people in Nepal there. And they have an interesting uh, saying there. They have the call it the G. Uh, uh, GNH, uh, gross national happiness, instead of okay. gross national product, gross national happiness. I like that. And the doctor, I mean the doctor, <laughs> the king, he has provided this for all the people, and they, they uh, actually really c go for this. And interesting about the country there, he's, he's 30 year, 38 years old, the king, and he's done wonders for the country. I mean, free education, free health, really? up to 12th grade for everybody. Oh, wow, that's great. So, yes, yeah, fantastic. And uh, so it's a very uh, interesting country, like it's only 700,000 people. And the saying there in Bhutan is if you want to say hello, you say Kuzu Zangpolo. That's hello, Kuzu Zangpolo. Sounds it, complicated. It's complicated. Me. Yeah, it was a hard one for us <laughs> to get going here. We had to sing the song every morning when we got on the bus there. And the other saying was Kadra Kadrinche, which is thank you. So those are the kind of two things there. Okay, once again, uh, when we got there, we flew into Paro from Kathmandu. It was a nice airport, only airport in uh, the, what we call their international airport. So we flew in there, we spent the time, to, uh, went to a beautiful uh, restaurant there, then went to, there's a big festival, it's a four day festival, all the people of, of the or that part of the country, they come there and it's like a big picnic for four straight days. Really? All the families come there, they're all dressed in their beautiful garb, you know, all their clothes, their traditional clothes and that. And uh, so, and I'll talk about what kind of clothes they are a, bit, a little bit later on here. And so uh, they're all unbelievable, the dances they're having, all the uh, entertainment goes on there. Then we, uh, we ended up going to the capital of Thimpu, which, or Thimpu City, which is the capital. We saw some buildings that were 250 years old that they had not taken down. They're, they have a lot of um, uh, building going on, and all the buildings cannot be more than six stories high. Nothing higher than okay. six stories. That's it. And we saw four dealerships. Is that because of earthquakes, pretty much? I don't know, but I think he just limited that, so he didn't okay. have any skyscrapers in Bhutan okay. there. Then we went to what they call the, the School of Astrology, which is really school of health. They had all these different medicines, and they pick plants, and you could, for any kind of health issue you have, they can provide a medicine for you. You could buy all kinds of things. How about food poisoning? Do they have anything uh, for that? They probably <laughs> did, but I don't know if they have certain leaves there. Uh, then we went to uh, the zoo there. There was this famous animal they called a Takin, T-A-K-I-N 
which is a national um, uh, animal there. And what the, the story behind that was this, this Buddha came in from Tibet and he said, I want something to eat. So he said, I want a cow and a goat. They killed it. He fed, all, fed them, uh, he fed themselves and all the people there. And then what they did, he put the bones on the, on the, uh, on the ground there and he put the goat's head on the, um, on the bones and became a Takian, which has got the body of, a, um, of the cow and the head of a, go of a goat. It's, it's a Takian, it's a strange looking animal. Does, does it really exist? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, it oh yeah, it's, it's, okay. yeah, it exists, yeah. All right. And then they have, like, we went to a, a heritage museum there where they were making rice wine and such, and uh, so tried it. It's pretty good. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> you buy, they had it in these Coke bottles, which you use Coke bottles. So I don't think I was going to buy any wine. It was in used Coke bottles, <laughs> so I didn't buy any of that. So, um, and then we went to what they call, where the um, king lives. It's called a Zong, D-Z-O-N-G. They're called Zongs. Okay. And they're a fourth system within Bhutan, you know, for the uh, safety of the country. And they're beautiful buildings. They're thick walls of about over three feet. There's not one nail to build these things. They're all with timber and mud or whatever they really? had to build these things. No, no nails. I guess they weren't invented by the, uh, then. Wow. Uh, then we went to a place that they were doing archery. And these guys were shooting arrows at 460 feet. And the wow. guys would be on each side, you know. They would shoot the arrows to this uh, target 460 feet away and they have to get 25 points. It's like a bullseye right. on a, a regular dartboard. Right. And a lot of these guys would stand each side of these, uh, these uh, bullseye and the arrows were coming in. I couldn't even see them and they're standing there and let these arrows come in. Now they've had some injuries because of the fact they, this is kind of a, they drink and they shoot arrows and all oh, that. Geez. Oh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's something to see. It's unbelievable. It's un, un, again, really something to see. Okay, that night we went to dinner. We had uh, graduates that graduated from the 12th grade. And we had two of the students sit at our table. Okay. And we had a lady and a gentleman, or I guess a teenager. And uh, both of them were just under the radar. They couldn't get to university because they didn't have the high enough grades. But I got a, a memo from the, or a text from uh, the, the guy, and he said he might be getting into university. The, the young lady, I'm not sure she'll get into it. Really and uh, then you'll see. Do they the speak English? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're speaking English. They're very good, yeah. And now this is where we'll have a picture in the video there where the men dress up and they call Goas, G-H-O-S, or Goas, and the women are called Kira. And the men, their uh, uh, costume goes only to their knees and they have stockings. Okay. The women go right to the ground. So okay. it's different. It's the opposite. They don't wear skirts, but well, it looks like a skirt for the men, but that's it's traditional in that country. That's what they wear. Okay. And it's very, very pretty. I mean, it looks so clean and everything else. And the women's jacket are called... Uh, Toego, T O E G O, Togo, Toego. And uh, they have a belt, it's called a Kira belt, which you know keeps the, uh, the costume up there. So, right. again, really neat here. Then we're talking about, you'll see the background here. Here we have the 138 foot two, uh, uh, Buddha that's on top of the mountain in Thimpu. Right. And it's, just, it's costing 100, and I think almost $200 million for this thing. And a lot of the countries, again, have donated the money to, for this particular Buddha. And interesting, they have a lion Buddha in Thailand, which is also 138 feet. I just made that connection here a couple of days ago. They had one there in Thailand, 138 feet, and it's a lion Buddha, same thing, and then you got the sitting Buddha. Wow. Uh, so it's kind of interesting there. So um, then we went to, a, uh, to Punaka, which is the old ancient uh, capital of, um, of Bhutan, but now it's uh, Thimphu. Uh, we went to this place, uh, as we were going through, we went to Dukkha Pass. It's at 3,000 meters high or 10,000 feet, and the right. Himalayas were in the background. Right. They had 108 stupas there, which was donated by the queen because there was 108 soldiers that died fighting India way back then. So okay. they made this beautiful, um, I guess, like a graveyard, but it's not, but it's the stupas. They have them all over there. And we'll see that again in the city. There's a nice picture of, of the stupas they have there for these people that died there. But again, the beautiful sites of the Himalayas there were just absolutely gorgeous. We had a, Hit the perfect day, it was clear as a bell, and you could see wow. all the Himalayas in the background there, and so magnificent views there, just unbelievable. Yes, yeah, so it looked, it look, you know, the pictures that you showed so look uh, really terrific. The country is the cleanest, I mean, compared to Nepal, Bhutan, such, such a clean country, it's unbelievable. All really? the mountain streams are crystal clear, everything, and there's no, no trash, no nothing. It's so much it's different. So I think that's why the King of Limbs, uh, you know, brings in like 14,000 uh, people per year only, that's so far. Uh, then, <coughs> then we went to, <coughs> to the Royal Botanical Gardens we saw there. It wasn't very good because it was not quite spring yet. The rhododendrons were not out yet. We right. saw a few flowers, but that was about it. Um, again, once again, going to uh, Panuka, uh, Panuka, uh, Punaka, um, we went to a, a town called, uh, I think it's called um, 
La Bosa. And this is where it goes back to what we saw in Iceland. They have a, 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 a museum of all penises. <laughs> this particular city, I mean, there's one of these Buddhas, he came over, right. you know, and so it's supposed to be the fertility and everything else. And uh, women come there, if they're not having babies, you know, they could be uh, basically blessed by this llama. He has this 10 inch, maybe uh, an ivory uh, wood or bone uh, a penis, and she puts them on a head, you know, and hopefully that she'll, you know, bear children. And so okay. it's kind of nice. So, but I mean, there's, you can buy all these penises all over, you know, in these little town here. So, I mean, they're all decorated, unbelievable. It's incredible. Uh, we, we slipped into a nunnery where these uh, young girls that went out to a nunnery. More from one extreme yeah, to the to other, the Jim. Other. These are 18, I mean, young girls that, you know, didn't have much of a life there, and uh, they're in poverty, and they were abused, and now they're becoming in this nunnery here, and uh, they, they don't provide a lot of, they don't provide any money. The king doesn't provide it, but all the monasteries get money, but the nunneries don't. There's 18 of them now. They're starting to, the queen is starting to help that situation out, but they get, become educated now, these young girls, so they can now translate that to other, you know, young girls here because they don't get a good education. Right. Um, uh, then we, uh, let's see, then we continued on uh, out of uh, Punaka. We went to another zong where the king lives, and then we saw other zongs where they had, the parliaments are met, and this is where the king is coronated and things of that nature. So it's kind of interesting to that there. Um, we saw some paper making, which is this particular thing here. This is traditional paper made, uh, made out of uh, what they call the Daphne bark of a tree. It's up over 3,000 feet, and they put these paintings on. They're just absolutely gorgeous. You know, this is the paper they make. It's really an they, interesting paper. They make that out of bark. Yeah, out of bark. They have to, you know, put it in water and heat it and do all right, kinds of right. things and squeeze it out and everything else. And went to a uh, place where they did incense um, training there, where they did, uh, for you can buy incense. incense. Um, and then uh, we went to another museum in, we came, now we're back in power with another museum, which is the Natural Museum of uh, Bhutan. We saw a lot of good things there, uh, of animals and everything else here. But the highlight of this whole trip was now going to uh, Tiger's Nest. Okay. Now this is at 10,000 feet on a vertical cliff. We have to travel from 7,000 feet to base camp up to 10,000 feet. It's about seven and a half hours round trip. Uh, to go there and back, which includes about an hour for lunch. So it's very brutal, <laughs> let's put it that way. So you hiked up this thing. Hiked up this thing, and where we went up like almost on a, I think on about a 30, uh, maybe 60 degree angle. 3,000 feet? 3,000 feet. Well, we went from 7,000 to 10,000. And okay. uh, it's about three, just about 2.7 miles long. And you're going all the way up, and all of a sudden near the end, you have to go 400 steps down, cross over like a cement, kind of a bridge there, a stone creek, and then 400, 300 steps back up to the monastery, and that's wow. brutal. That was brutal, and um, well, once again, it was it was good. And uh, you can take up to the first point where the cafeteria. You can rent a donkey or a horse for twenty bucks. Okay. It took us an hour and fifteen minutes to get to there, but then by the donkey, you got there in about 35, 40 minutes. But after that, you have to walk and come all the way back down. But it's the most uh, visited place in Bhutan is the Tiger's Nest. Again, it's at ten thousand feet or three thousand meters. It's just absolute to get there. And I wasn't going to give up, even though I want to give up three or four times. But there was uh, 16 in our group, 15 of us made it. Really? And one had a hip operation, he couldn't make it, so he stood right. at the cafeteria, he took the donkey up or the horse up there. Right, right. So it was kind of interesting there, so. But it was a good trip. Uh, the fact that uh, this is our third trip that Samantha have taken where we've celebrated our birthday together. Oh, is that right? So, yeah, so it's oh, kind of cool. there. Yeah, it's kind of cool there. This is so. your traveling partner. Yeah, my traveling partner, so this is the third time. And uh, so they celebrated in different places. We had birthday cake and such. And, uh, right. But a wonderful trip. I mean, if I were to go back, it'd strictly be Bhutan. I mean, I would go back there in a heartbeat. It's really? such a beautiful and clean country, just absolutely great. Well, Jim, thank you so much for such a great presentation. What a good time you must have yeah, had. It was fantastic. I mean, yeah. I, I would go back there in a heartbeat, no doubt. Well, thank you very much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for Jim for joining us today. Have a great time. Thank you, George. When's your next trip, by the way? Uh, it's in September to Russia. Okay. Yep. We'll see you later. <laughs> see you then. later. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Bye. Okay.